Good morning and welcome. It's so nice to see you all here and hear all of the talking and the fellowshipping. Let's worship together and let's start by saying welcome and singing it together. And let's stand in body or spirit. In the name and grace and peace of Jesus, our resurrecting Christ. Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship at St. Paul's. My name is Kyle Reynolds. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is my joy to welcome you into worship this morning. Uh, if it feels like perhaps the Holy Spirit is already on the move, it may be because it's Kids Day, which is a great celebration around here. It might also be because the lights are working for the first time since the storm a couple of weeks ago, thanks to Jesse. Um, and we know that the Holy Spirit moves in stage lighting. Uh, or it may be just because we're gathered here together. Uh, I'm grateful that you're here. A couple of announcements. First of all, today is Kids Day, which is a great celebration. Uh, from 4 to 7 tonight, we'll have families gathered here. Uh, we'll gather in this space together for uh, some reflections and a message from Pastor Jessica. And then uh, we will move about stations and gather all together at the end of the evening for pizza. Uh, if you have children uh, in your life, in your neighborhood, in your community, I hope you'll bring them uh, and if not, you know, you can come hang out as well. Uh, but we're very excited for, uh, for today. Also, uh, this morning, uh, just a little bit ago, the Micah class kicked off uh, a study about how the Bible came to be, led by Reverend Marilyn Gregory. And I believe people can still come next week and join. Is that correct? You'll send them the homework. Um, 
to get them caught up. Uh, that's happening throughout the month. And so if you would like to be involved in that, we would love to plug you in. Uh, next week, uh, we have a lot of fun stuff happening in worship. So the school year kicks off uh, for most of our students and families in about 10 days. And so uh, next week in worship, we will have a blessing for school staff, uh, school workers, uh, those who work in education, as well as for parents and for students at the beginning of a new year. Uh, I would encourage students to bring a backpack or uh, a lunchbox, something to be blessed. So we'll do a blessing during the service. And then uh, after the service, uh, we'll be doing blessings uh, with each family individually. Uh, and I'm very excited about that. So I would invite you to uh, come and be a part of that. We'll have a small group fair happening in the welcome area. Uh, between services and after service, so you can find a way to plug in uh, to grow your faith in the season ahead and to get connected. Uh, we will also start choir at 8.30 next week. Uh, youth group will start in the afternoon, and we'll kick off the fall portion of our uh, Bible reading program together. So there's lots of good stuff happening next week. I think it's going to be really fun. This is a great opportunity to invite somebody uh, to see some of the best of what's happening at St. Paul's, so I hope you'll consider doing that. And I think it's going to be a really fun morning of worship. Uh, two other notes for you. First of all, the Tiny Tots Triathlon is coming up this fall. Uh, this is something that we sponsor, that we're a part of. Um, we'll get you more details about how you can be a part of that. But if you have a student that you want to be a part of that, I've been asked to remind you to register because those spots fill up very quickly. So uh, it's still several weeks out, but that's, uh, that's live and, and you should get signed up soon. Uh, last thing that I wanted to say is that we're doing home gatherings currently, and there's a couple of uh, home gatherings still to go where, where it's a chance for me to hear from you and you to hear from me as we get to know one another. Um, if you cannot find a, a spot to plug in uh, because it's full or because the times don't work, would you let me know or somebody on the transition team, and we'll see uh, what we can do. We have the opportunity to host a couple more of those if it's needed before the end of the month, but just communicate, and we would love to get you plugged in on that. Friends, this morning we continue our series called Learning to Listen. We've talked about what it means to listen to ourselves, to listen to God, and today we talk about what it means to listen to one another, uh, particularly those of us who gather together in this community called church. Uh, I would invite you to stand as you are able for our call to worship as we continue uh, in worship together with one another. Friends, what a joy it is to be gathered here together in this place of worship, to reflect and to sing, to laugh and to pray, to learn and to listen in community. People of God, let us be open to the Spirit. We open our ears to hear God's wisdom. We open our eyes to see God's glory. We open our hearts to receive God's goodness. We open our mouths to sing God's praise. People of God, let us be open to the Spirit. And let's sing together. <laughs> Sorry, I thought there was something else. All right, let's sing together. In unity, we lift our song.
Let us now affirm our faith together. In the beginning, God spoke, and all that is came into being. To Moses, God spoke and called with a purpose. To Israel, God spoke and promised liberation. In Jesus, God spoke, the very word of God living with us. In time, God spoke and promised to make all things new. Today and to us, God is still speaking. Let us have ears that we may hear. minutes our greeters will be coming around with our attendance pads it is such a joy to worship with you today and thank you for registering your attendance with us i'd like to invite our kids to join us for kids connection miss sherry's at the back of the sanctuary we're going to head downstairs for a lesson and parents this week the older kids will be coming back up for communion but in future weeks we changed rooms we're just across the hall you'll hear us um, but uh, we are now in a bigger space because praise jesus we needed one I'd like to invite all of us to sing together, Jesus Loves Little Children, which is adapted each week with words from our welcome statement. shoes gonna walk around heaven and tell the news just listen how it's raining all day all night just listen how it's raining all day Didn't 
two by two, the ox and the fox and the kangaroo. The sun came out and dried the land. The rain was stretched on by God's great hand. Just listen how it's raining all day, all night. Just listen how it's raining all day. This morning, our scripture reading comes from Exodus 18. If you have a Bible, I would invite you to turn there to follow along. A couple weeks ago, we read early in Moses' story when he goes into the wilderness of Midian and and sort of is finally able to listen to himself. Uh, Since that time in Exodus, he has had his back and forth with Pharaoh and the, the people of Israel have been sent forth and they now find themselves in a wilderness. At the beginning of chapter 18, we read that Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, comes to visit him and and sort of to bring the family along, and uh, they have some conversation. I'll talk a bit about that later, Uh, but then it says that shortly after uh, this happened, so I invite you to hear these words. The next day, Moses sat as judge for the people, while the people stood around him from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw what he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another. And I make known to them the statutes and the instructions of God. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you. For the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You should represent the people before God, and you should bring their cases before God. Teach them the statutes and instructions, and make known to them the way that they are to go and the things that they are to do. You should also look for able men among all the people who will fear God and are trustworthy and who hate dishonest gain. Set such men over over them as officers of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you, but decide every minor case among themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will go to their home in peace. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. May God add blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. So I wonder if just for a moment you might think back uh, about uh, a piece of advice that you received from somebody who was a little bit further on down the road of life than you were. If there was a a mentor or a colleague or a friend, somebody who had experienced a bit more of life, who had seen a bit more, who gave you some, some piece of counsel, some piece of wisdom, some piece of information that that then changed the way that you live. Has that happened to you? We we develop these sort of relationships in formal and informal ways. We call them mentors, or or we don't. Uh, We develop them in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our workplaces, and, and I hope in our churches. Has there been somebody in your experience, in your life, who has spoken into your reality and allowed you to adjust the way that you live? I've been gifted in my life and in my ministry to have some wonderful mentors, I was thinking about some of the, the things that they had said to me uh, this week. There was uh, Dr. Fowler, who was a seminary professor, who taught me about the third sacrament, which is coffee. <laughs> he also modeled what it was to do life and community together with a group of students. He would gather uh, maybe once a month or so at Walker Brothers Pancake House for breakfast and conversation to talk about what we were learning about ourselves and about ministry and help us process through all that was happening in that season. 
I, I had a senior pastor while I was still in Chicago who uh, uh, used to say at the end of all of our pre-worship meetings and we would pray together, he would end by saying, give him heaven. And we would go out. I've been known to say the same thing. He also told me as I prepared to move back to Kansas that, that I shouldn't be surprised if I found that my priorities and interests changed as seasons change. I, I thought he was crazy, but he was right. I, I've had other mentors. One of my longest friends and mentors has, has uh, modeled for me over and over and over again what it means to be radically present to whoever is in front of you and what it looks like to lead with love. What's, what's that look like in your life? In what ways ha have people spoken some bit of wisdom and experience into your life? I wonder if it's ever come maybe with a bit of a sharper edge. We really like it when mentors say good and uplifting things to us. We maybe like it less when they say what you are doing is not good. That's what Jethro says to Moses in the, the scripture today. What you are doing is not good. Those words are harder to hear. I was trying to think through the many examples I've had in my life this week of that happening. And there was one example that kept coming to mind. I was, I was in college at the time, and uh, there was a dispute that arose in my fraternity about the actions of, of one of our members. And it wasn't anything egregious, but it, it became much ado about nothing. Uh, somehow in the process, I was nominated to be the ringleader of my ring of the circus that, that came to be uh, in the days that followed. And, and so there was a lot of conversation, and finally a meeting was called so that we could take a vote, because this always works out great. It didn't, and so there was a, a, a lot of tension in the room as this conversation started to happen. I, I came in right as the meeting was starting, and so uh, the corner of the room that, that my part of the circus was in, all the seats were full, and so uh, I was standing up, and, and when it came time uh, for me to speak, I, I began to talk and, and shared what I'm sure was a moving and eloquent oration. Uh, people were weeping with, with something uh, from all that was said. And when I was finished, there began to be more conversation as there had been when other people talked. And uh, the tension was rising and people were sort of talking over one another. And lots was happening until from the other side of the room, there came a voice that cut through all the chaos that said, you need to sit down, sir. I'm self-conscious as I say that out loud because I'm the only one standing in this room. <laughs> it was the voice uh, of one of our advisors a friend and a mentor of mine who was telling me that I needed to sit down, that my standing in a room full of people sitting was inappropriate, that I was shaping the way of the conversation more than I intended to and in ways that I didn't, and I was claiming an authority that I, I didn't have. The whole room grew silent as he passionately told me why it was that I was out of line. I, I found a seat and sat down a little bit embarrassed, and he was right, it changed the conversation. I have thought about that incident more times than I can tell you. It led me later in my undergraduate career to do a deep dive into the study of small group dynamics and the ways uh, that, that uh, set up in a room and the ways that posture and, and noise make a difference in how conversations happen. When I was in seminary, still later in life, I, I did a similar dive as far as that relates to our discipleship path and how it is that we grow in faith and how it is that we hear and listen to one another. And I've always been much more aware of my place in a room, of my posture, of where I am compared to others and how it is that I use my voice. Sometimes good mentors, good leaders will say to us, what you are doing is not good. And if it's spoken to us in love, it can be helpful. So I want you to go back. Maybe it was a time uh, where somebody that, that was a mentor, that was a leader, that was a guide, that was a coach for you said, what you are doing is not good. Maybe it's a, a different experience. But I want you to think, why is it? Or, or perhaps the first thing that you thought of, uh, why is it that that piece of advice, that piece of wisdom was so meaningful to you? Why was it that it, it is stuck with you? Why was it that it, it continues to influence the way you live even today? Might it be that, that somebody saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself, good or bad? Might it be that that person who was speaking those words saw something in the context, in the setting, in the surrounding that, that you weren't aware of? 
Or could it be that uh, that person who was speaking, they had a little bit longer vision than you did. Uh, they could see where this was going, what was on the horizon, the direction you were heading, and they, they wanted to tell you about it. Or, or did they sense something about what this meant for the organization, for the community, for the church, for the, the, the workplace, whatever it was that, that was being talked about, the family, what it meant for this group and why it was important that it be gotten right? Think of various seasons. People who speak into our lives like this can do one or all of those things. Jethro, for his part, as he's talking to Moses, I think is doing all of those things. I think he sees in Moses that Moses is teetering on burnout, that what he's doing isn't sustainable, and he says, this has to change. Maybe you've had somebody come to you and say, I, I don't think you're being your best self right now. I think Jethro saw what was happening around Moses. Perhaps he heard the murmuring from people as they were waiting for Moses. Perhaps he saw that Moses had made in himself a bottleneck that was preventing progress from happening. And I imagine that Moses didn't hear all of that. Maybe you've had somebody come and say, when you do this, it has this effect on people around you. I think when Jethro uh, says this, he, he sees where all of this is going. He sees that, uh, that there is going to be a road that they're going on for Moses personally and for the community that nobody wants to be a part of. He can see where this is headed. Maybe you've had somebody come and say, this isn't the road that you want to walk. I think Jethro also had the ability to see beyond Moses and what this community needed, what it meant for the organization what it meant for this new people, the Israelites, to do life together, and that they had to pass this on. This chapter is a beautiful chapter, I think, in the scriptures and in the story of Moses. It's beautiful because it begins with this, this reuniting, and it's, it's full of like all of this positive, feel-good energy. As, as Jethro is coming out into the wilderness, there is this, uh, this scene where there's a great amount of affection and admiration and respect shared between Jethro and Moses, and you get the idea that there is a lot that's built into this. There's mutual affection between the two of them. There's some notion of a reunion that's truly beautiful. And then there's this scene where, where Moses is sharing all that God has done, all that God did in Egypt to bring the people out of Egypt, all that God did with Pharaoh. And Moses is saying, Jethro, you wouldn't believe what's happened. And Jethro is listening. You get the sense that it was a conversation that went way, late into the night. I love this text because it shows the relationship here in a beautiful way. I think that's also important because we need to be reminded that, that very often these these sorts of instruction, they come better when they're given in the context of relationships. So there's, there's that beautiful piece that happens. But I also like it because it says something to us about who we're called to be as a people of God. Jethro could have said to Moses, you know, this just isn't that important. You should let the people figure it out on their own. They don't need you. Let them deal with the minor cases. But that's not what happens. Because one of the things we understand in this text is that justice matters to God. The Israelite people are figuring out how to administer justice as a community together on their own with autonomy for the first time. If they are to be a blessing to the world, if they are to be blessed, they're, to called, they're called to live in certain ways. And a part of that is to say that God values justice, that God's people must prioritize that. Jethro comes and says, in fact, this is so important that you have to get it right. It's worth the discomfort of me telling you what you're doing is not good because we have to get this right if we're to be the people God calls us to be. I love this chapter for all that is wrapped into it, the relational piece, the mentoring component, the, the heart for justice that comes clearly through this text. Today, I want us to reflect on what it means for us to learn to listen to people whose perspective is different than ours. I want us to talk about what it means for us to allow ourselves to be in relationship and to be changed by folks who have different experiences, different beliefs, different views, 
different realities to allow us to be changed by that. And most specifically today, I want to talk about how that happens with people with whom we are in relationship, people that are in our family, that are in our workplace, that we share a community with, that we share a church with. I want to think about what it means for us to listen to folks who see the world differently and to allow ourselves to be changed by that. It might be because it's Children's Day, Kids' Day. It might be because of this this Jethro, Moses generational component. There's a lot of ways that we could talk about this. We could talk about what it means uh, to listen to people with whom we're in relationship that that have uh, different experiences or or different perspectives or understandings. Uh, We could talk about what it means to listen to people who have uh, different uh, experiences because of the color of their skin or their gender identity or because of their immigration status. We could talk about what it means to listen to people who have uh, different political affiliations or whatever the case is, but I want to talk specifically today about what it means to listen to people who have different generational perspectives. And again, I think I just kept getting drawn to that because because of Kids Day, because of this relationship. The truth of the matter is that, that we are inundated with all sorts of sources that tell us what we are to value, how we should organize our life, how we should spend our time and our money, what we should be chasing after, what we should invest in, what we should uh, spend our time in, where we should put our children or our grandchildren. We're inundated with messages that tell us what we need to be happy and to be enough and to be finally settled. And part of the problem with learning to listen is learning how to filter all of that. I think sometimes we can't listen because we're overwhelmed by the noise. Even from people we love and value, we have to learn uh, what to take in, to assimilate into our lives, and and what maybe doesn't apply for us. Let's bring it down a little bit and talk specifically about what happens in the church. There's a a lot of questions about what the church is to be in 2023. Uh, When we're in a post-pandemic reality and nobody knows what the future looks like, when Sunday morning uh, attendance has been declining for years, when the rise of the nuns is is a regular topic of conversation, what does it mean for us to be the church? This question gets asked all the time. What's the place? What's the value? What's the importance of the church? And I'll tell you that one of the things that I think is most beautiful and most valuable and most important about the church is that it's one of the few places in many people's lives where there is a gathering of intergenerational folks who come together. I think that's one of the most important and most valuable aspects that we have to offer because there is so little of that that happens outside in our culture. And we need that. We need to hear from one another. We need that experience. If we do gather with people across generational lines, so often uh, there's some sort of power dynamic involved. One person is a client and one person is a service provider. One person is in charge and one person is a subordinate. The church is unique because when we gather together, all of us come together to worship, to reflect, to pray, to lead, to serve, to grow, to understand what it means to be people of faith in this day and this time. And I think it's one of the most beautiful things about the church that we do so across generational lines from birth to death. For people who are young and people who are older, for people who have been around this church for decades and folks who just walked through the door three weeks ago. We gather with all these different perspectives and we hopefully learn to listen to one another. By the way, it may so happen that every once in a while that gets messy and awkward. Have you ever experienced that? You looked around your section and you realized like you were the oldest one or the youngest one by far and you weren't sure that you belonged in this place. Let me say that I think that's good and that's beautiful. It's challenging. There's a reason that we tend to withdraw to our, our tribes, our people who have similar experiences. It's much easier, but there's so much value in it. And when we do it and when we listen and when we grow and when we practice and when we hear, we get a little taste of the kingdom of God with and for and through one another, I think it's absolutely beautiful. And it's worth maintaining because it's one of the only places where this happens in many people's weeks. So it happens on Sunday mornings. It happens in in committees and councils and teams as we serve together. 
It happens when you're working in the garden or serving at cross lines or, or serving down at the hub. It, it happens when we participate in, in the Be the Light book club. It happens when we uh, listen to one another uh, in, in formal and informal ways. Sydney, who leads our youth, has just put something out this week that, that said uh, she's looking for people who will come and be a part of our youth group. She even said you could do it like twice a semester. You don't have to do it every single week, uh, but if you would be willing to go and to listen and to learn and to walk alongside and to be supportive, I promise you our youth have a lot to learn, to teach us. That's what I meant to say. Also learn, but I meant to say teach us in that particular moment. This week I was, on that note, uh, <laughs> this week I was thinking about Jesus saying in the Gospels that unless we become like children, we'll never experience the kingdom of God. See, there's something to be learned for, from those who are older, from those who have experienced more of life, from those that we call mentors, but there's also something to be learned from, from the short leggeds, from our youth for all of us to, to learn from their experiences. And I hope that we as a community are learning to listen to one another. One of the things that I've loved in this first month that I've been here has been the home gatherings that we've had. And each one of those gatherings has been different. They've looked different. They've sounded different. And a lot of that is because of the, the, the age groups that have gathered. There have been some that, that are, are really have been intergenerational. There have been some that were younger and some that were older. And and it's been so fascinating to hear the experience in those intergenerational ones. Uh, it's been interesting to hear people uh, listen to one another. You can, you can sort of watch it happening as people listen to one another and their experiences. And I've loved, I've loved hearing about the heartbeat of this congregation. And while there are differences in our experiences, there are different ways that we've connected. One thing that has arisen is that this church shares a heartbeat across its generations, that there is a desire to see justice lived out because of what God has done for and with and in and through us, uh, to see that lived out in the world, that there is a commitment to that, that there's a desire to see people nurtured and growing and living their faith in real ways. There's a desire to be connected. Now, how that manifests, the shape that takes, it looks different. It's looked different in different years, in different decades, in different contexts as culture has changed. But that heartbeat has been consistent, and I love hearing that because I think it's a, it's a little taste, a little glimpse of the kingdom of God. So as a church, I hope that we're learning to listen to one another, that with intention we're listening to people who have different perspectives, uh, people from different generations or people with different life experiences, that we're learning to listen to one another, to value others' contributions and to trust that there's something that will shape who we are. And when we engage in that work, friends, I believe that we're blessed ourselves because of the information that we get to take in, the experience that we get to take in, but we'll also find that we're stronger together when we're able to listen to one another and to let arise out of those things that we hold, that we share as a community, to let arise what it means to live that out in this time, in this place. And it matters because the witness of this congregation matters. And if the work that's happening here and the way that God is moving in the message of inclusion and justice that this congregation believes in matters for the world, then we ought to want to be, it to be as strong as it possibly can be. It just so happens that every once in a while, I take my own advice. I try not to do it too often because I fear I'd run out of things to preach on. But this week, I was reading through this text, and I, I've been thinking about this. And midway through the week, I was like, you know, I should, I should probably do this. And so uh, I connected this week with two colleagues, one who's probably 10 or 15 years ahead of me in ministry, and one who is right at the end of their career and we had conversations, and I said, so uh, I just moved into this new church. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, I've just moved into this new church. Tell me what it is that you do, that you learn, that, that you ask. What is it that you're looking for? What is it that you're listening for when you've been in that setting? And then we're in this post-pandemic reality where really nobody knows what they're doing. So, so what are you reading? What are you studying? What are you focusing on? What are you celebrating? Where are you putting your energy? And it was so life-giving. Those two conversations were among the highlights of my week. So friends, 
my challenge for you this week is for you to find ways to be in intentional conversation with people who have a different perspective. Uh, maybe especially somebody who has a, a different generational perspective than you do. And I, I hope you'll think about doing that in your neighborhood. I, I hope you'll think about doing that in your professional life. Maybe you'll think about doing that with a loved one, with a family member, to ask them a little bit of their story. But I also hope that you will find time this week or, or this month or in the school year ahead to do that with people here at this church in this congregation. Maybe there's somebody who comes to mind for you, who's caught your eye. Maybe you know their name or maybe you don't. Maybe you've never asked before. I hereby, as your pastor, deputize you to ask their name. It is okay. And perhaps to ask how it is that they got here to St. Paul's, what it is that they value about this community. I give you permission to ask where they plug in, what gives them life, what their hopes are for the future of this community of faith. Friends, we are so much better and stronger and fuller of the people that God wants us to be when we're willing and able to listen to one another, even across lines of difference. My hope as a community is that we're learning to do that, willing to step out, willing to engage in the messiness, trusting that God is speaking to each one of us through the communities around us. Amen. As we continue in worship, you have an opportunity to respond to all that we've shared today. You can do that in a few ways. You can do that by lighting a candle. Uh, perhaps you want to do that as a sign of a, a prayer that's on your heart or maybe as a, as a physical representation of a commitment you're making to do some listening. Maybe you want to do it as a sign of gratitude for somebody who has mentored or guided you in the past. Uh, during this time, you'll also have the opportunity of, to give of your gifts, tithes, and offerings. There will be a plate here and a plate at the back. Uh, part of what we do is we return part of what God has entrusted to us to invest in the ministry and the work that God is doing in this community to trust that this story is worth telling to those around us. The last thing that you can do is you can sit and you can pray where you are and spend time in reflection. However it is that you best want to speak and process and, and hear from God in this moment, I would invite you to do so. The time is yours, and I trust that God's Spirit is continuing to speak.
You may be seated. Friends, some things change and some things stay the same. In every generation, Jesus' people have gathered around a table like this. And we've gathered as God's kids. Knowing the kingdom of heaven comes to such as these, we come on this kid's day remembering how Jesus taught us to pray as kids to a loving parent, asking, give us this day our daily bread. One thing I love and, and, and I've learned from my kids uh, in coming to communion is that um, they always want more. My kids, it's like, can't wait for leftovers, seconds, thirds. Um, we want more bread. We want more juice. And so I pray that this morning that you come and, and, and are filled in the ways that you need to be filled by God's grace. But I pray that we also come and get hungry and get hungry for more. Um, I think God has a gift for us together in that. And so on this Kids Day, and, and every time that we share in communion, it's really important that we say that um, whatever your age or stage, all are welcome at this table. And so uh, specifically on first Sundays, we try and bring kids back to be part of our communion meal together. So we get to join together as a family in this time. If you'd pray with me, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. It's a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, your creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image. You breathed into us the very breath of life. And God, when we turned away and our love failed, your love toward us remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God. You kept speaking to us through your prophets, the ones who looked for the day when justice would roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation would no longer lift up sword against nation and neither would we learn war anymore. And so, God, it's with your people on earth and all the company of heaven. As your kids, we come together and praise your name and join in the unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth is full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus the Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and announce that the time had finally come you would save your people. Jesus healed the sick and fed the hungry and ate with sinners, and by the baptism of his suffering and death and resurrection, God, you gave birth to the church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death. You made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. And at Jesus' ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand forever. On that night, when Jesus gave himself to the end for us, he gathered his friends around a table. He took the bread and gave thanks, broke the bread and shared it with his friends and said, take, eat. This is my body. It's given for you. Do this and remember me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and again raised it in a blessing, shared it with his friends and said, drink of this, all of you. This cup is my blood. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this every time you drink it and remember me. So we do, God, we come remembering your mighty acts in Jesus Christ and we come to offer ourselves once again in praise and thanksgiving, a holy and living sacrifice made possible by and union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim together the mystery of faith, saying, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. God, pour out your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we would be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, God, make us one with Christ, one with one another, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast together at his heavenly banquet forever. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory belongs to you, Almighty God, now and forever. And God's people said, Amen. And we pray boldly 
as the kids of God that Jesus taught us to be with the prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Again, it's really important that we say all means all when all we say all are welcome at this table. Uh, we join together as God's kids, as God's family around this table. I'm so glad to get to do that with, that, with you. Uh, I think we may need one more server if someone's just feeling compelled to jump up. Hey, all right. Um, and uh, so there'll be a gluten-free option, uh, or you can come forward and uh, receive the bread as a gift. There's nothing we can do to earn it. It's just a God's gift by grace to you. Come and receive the gift of, of the bread in, in your hands and dip it in the cup. I pray you'll come, and I pray you'll come, like I said, getting ready, wanting more. Come wanting more.
let us stand in body or spirit and sing together our closing blessing that we have the opportunity to gather with one another, to live into community, to learn to listen to the various perspectives and ages, hopes and dreams and experiences in this place called St. Paul's. Your life, your life is a gift, an opportunity to share with another and to be influenced by another. I hope you find ways to do that here and in the world beyond this church. May you go trusting that that is good and holy work. Go in the strength and the love of God. Amen. Amen.